Alright, with glutamate now covered, we can move on to the next neurotransmitter. If you recall from the start of this section, one huge difference between neurons in the central nervous system and neurons at the neuromuscular junction is the fact that neurons in the central nervous system can have an excitatory or inhibitory output on the postsynaptic cell. Accordingly, given that we've established that glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, we need to now consider what is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. The main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system is gamma-aminobutyric acid, or simply GABA. To understand this neurotransmitter, let's first consider its synthesis and signal termination mechanism, and then we'll discuss the postsynaptic receptors as well as what inhibition it provides to the nervous system. Alright, so just like the other neurotransmitters we've covered, GABA is synthesized and packaged at the presynaptic terminal. Interestingly enough, it turns out that GABA is synthesized from glutamate, and this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme named glutamic acid decarboxylase, or simply GAD. As a noteworthy fact, for GAD to properly function, it requires a cofactor named pyridoxal phosphate, which is derived from vitamin B6. Hence, a deficiency in this vitamin could lead to problems with GABA communications in the nervous system. Now, since GABA is made from glutamate, you will notice that there will be a lot of overlaps between the synthesis and the reuptake process of GABA in comparison to glutamate. Nonetheless, let's continue with the mechanism. After synthesis, GABA is transported into the synaptic vesicles via the vesicular inhibitory amino acid transporter or VGAT. VGAT uses the gradient of protons that is generated by VATPase to import GABA inside the vesicles. After action potential propagation and calcium-mediated exocytosis of the vesicles, the GABA molecules are released in the cleft and interact with postsynaptic receptors. To remove GABA from the synaptic cleft, inhibitory synapses also form tripartite synapses with astrocytes. Astrocytes and presynaptic terminals have particular GABA transporters named GAT that co-transport GABA with sodium inside. The GABA that directly returns to the presynaptic terminal can get recycled or broken down if it is not needed. In the astrocyte, GABA gets reconverted into glutamate by GAD, the same enzyme that did the opposite reaction in the presynaptic terminal. This glutamate is then converted into glutamine by glutamine synthetase. The glutamine can then leave the astrocyte by the system N transporter and return into the cell through the system A transporter. The two transporters co-transport sodium with glutamine. When glutamine is inside the presynaptic terminal, it gets reconverted into glutamate by glutaminase, which completes our reuptake cycle. When GABA is in the synaptic cleft, it can interact with both ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. The ionotropic receptors for GABA is named GABA-A, and the metabotropic receptor is named GABA-B. Let's start with the ionotropic channel. First, I want to briefly discuss the structure of the GABA-A channel because it turns out that it has a very similar structure to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Indeed, the GABA-A channel is a pentamer, usually composed out of two alpha, two beta, and one gamma or delta subunit. To open GABA-A channels, there are two binding sites in between the two alpha and beta subunits that upon GABA binding, opens the pore. When the pore opens, the receptor conducts chloride inside the cell, but we'll come back to that aspect shortly. Another important structural aspect of this channel is that, in comparison to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which had negatively charged acidic residues near the pore, the GABA-A receptor has positively charged basic residues, which makes the channel selective for anions, like chloride, instead of cations. Now, in terms of agonists and antagonists, GABA-A channels are highly targeted by several types of drugs. Some notable drugs include benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and alcohol. All these different drugs and GABA bind to different sites on the receptor, but all of them cause the receptor to open or at least increase the likelihood of being open. For example, it is known that benzodiazepines bind between the alpha and gamma subunits, yet, on their own, they do not activate the channel completely. However, when GABA is bound and benzodiazepines are also bound, the activity of the channel is considerably increased, which considerably enhances the effects of the GABA-A receptor.
Alright, now in terms of its function, the GABA-A receptor is essentially a ligand-gated chloride channel. This means that when two molecules of GABA bind, the receptor opens a path for chloride ions to flow. If you recall from some of our first discussions, the respective concentrations in and out of the cell for chloride are about 4 and 110 millimolars. This imbalance in concentrations already hints at the fact that chloride will be driven to enter the cell purely from its chemical gradient. From the Nernst equation, we can compute that the equilibrium potential of chloride is about negative 87 millivolts. Recall that the equilibrium potential is the value at which the chemical and electrical gradients of chloride are balanced such that there is no net current going across the membrane. To visualize the equilibrium potential value better, we can plot the IV curve of chloride. From the conventions that we have established, remember that positive current is called outward and is hyperpolarizing, whereas negative current is called inward and represents depolarizations. Hence, at resting voltages above negative 87 millivolts, the produced current is hyperpolarizing, and below negative 87 millivolts, the current is depolarizing. To see the effects of GABA-A receptors on postsynaptic partners, let's consider a plot of the membrane potential as a function of time for a neuron that has a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. When GABA-A receptors open, the entry of chloride into the cells pushes the membrane potential towards the equilibrium potential of chloride. Because this hyperpolarization stems from a synaptic event, it is also often referred to as an inhibitory postsynaptic potential or simply IPSP, which directly opposes excitatory postsynaptic potentials or EPSPs that we've previously covered with glutamate and acetylcholine. When this synaptic event happens alone and the equilibrium potential of chloride is below the resting membrane potential, this is considered to be the typical form of inhibition. But a different form of inhibition can occur under different conditions. This form of inhibition is named shunting inhibition and to understand it, let's consider the plot for the membrane potential as a function of time. In cases where shunting inhibition occurs, there are generally two features that cause it to happen. First, the equilibrium potential for chloride closely equals the resting membrane potential. So, for the purposes of this example, imagine that the equilibrium potential for chloride now equals negative 70 millivolts. The second aspect that is present is an excitatory input, and here, for this example, we will assume that it comes from a glutamate receptor, EMPA. Remember that the equilibrium potential of the EMPA receptor is near zero, because the channel is a non-selective cation channel for sodium and potassium. Now, if the GABA channels were to open alone, there would be no net current coming from them because the cell is already at the equilibrium potential for these channels. Inversely, if the AMPA channels were to open alone, their activity would increase the membrane potential towards their own equilibrium potential to reach the threshold. Now, here is where it gets interesting. If both channels open simultaneously, the excitatory input by the AMPA receptor will be lessened in comparison to when it opens alone because the GABA-8 channels essentially shunt the depolarization towards the resting state. Indeed, when the two channels open, you can almost imagine their combined activity as a tug-of-war and in this instance, the GABA channels pull the AMPA activity down. Another way of conceptualizing shunting inhibition is to think about GABA receptors in terms of positive charges. Indeed, in terms of depolarizations and hyperpolarizations, the activity of positive and negative charges are a bit interchangeable if we inverse their directions. Hence, instead of thinking about negative ions entering the membrane, we can imagine the GABA channels as channels that let positive ions flow out of the cell. Now, due to the fact that currents must always flow in closed loops, you can imagine that when the two channels are activated together, the GABA channels offer an additional path for the positive charges that have entered from AMPA to leave. Again, as a result, the depolarization is shunted. Alright, as a final comment about ionotropic GABA receptors, I want to mention that although GABA is usually covered as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, we are assuming that we are talking about a mature neuron because in the developing brain, GABA forms excitatory connections. To understand how this can occur, remember that whether a channel produces inhibition or excitation is purely a product of the ionic concentrations in which the neuron is baited in.
Early in development, the chloride concentrations are mainly controlled by the NKCC co-transporter, which transports one sodium, one potassium, and two chloride ions inside the cell. As a result, the internal concentration of chloride is very high and its equilibrium potential becomes higher than the resting membrane potential. Thus, when GABA receptors open, chloride ions leave the cell and cause a depolarization. In mature neurons, however, the NKCC co-transporter gets downregulated and a new transporter by the name of KCC2 gets expressed. KCC2 exports one potassium and one chloride out of the cell, which makes the internal chloride concentration very small. As a result, the equilibrium potential for chloride becomes more negative and the IV curve shifts below the resting membrane potential. Now, when the GABA receptors open, it causes a hyperpolarizing current due to chloride efflux. For that reason, you can see that inhibition and excitation comes from the reversal potential of the ions that flow through the channels and not necessarily from the structural properties of the channels themselves. Now that we have a good idea of what is going on with ionotropic channels, let's discuss the metabotropic GABA-B receptors. These receptors are generally associated with two main mechanisms of action, although I am more than certain they mediate many more. Nonetheless, let's cover the two that are the most common. The first mechanism from GABA-B channels is actually very similar to one we've covered for the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and the metabotropic glutamate receptors. This mechanism acts through the GIG protein and mediates the activation of GERC potassium channels to inhibit the postsynaptic cell. Indeed, given that the reversal potential of potassium, which is about negative 80 millivolts, is always below the resting membrane potential, the opening of these channels causes an efflux of potassium that hyperpolarizes the cell. The activation of these channels comes from the dissociation of the beta and GABA subunit during GIG protein activation. The second mechanism occurs on the presynaptic side, and here again, the GIG protein is used. When the G protein gets activated, the dissociation of the beta and gamma subunit from the alpha causes the blockage of presynaptic voltage-gated calcium channels. Given that the calcium channels are essential for transmitter release, the blockage of these channels prevents neurotransmitters from being released and signaling onto the postsynaptic cell. Hence, this presynaptic blockage leads to a postsynaptic inhibition. Now, based on what we've discussed on the ionotropic and metabotropic channels, we can establish that there is three general ways to inhibit the postsynaptic cell. The first is through the action of the GABA-A receptor, which hyperpolarizes the cell by letting chloride ions enter. This form of inhibition includes the shunting inhibition we discussed as well. The second way to inhibit the postsynaptic cells is through the activation of postsynaptic GERC channels by GABA-B activation, and the third way is by preventing or at least diminishing presynaptic release by blocking presynaptic calcium channels again by GABA-B activation. Before I conclude my discussion on inhibition, I want to briefly mention that there is another important inhibitory neurotransmitter by the name of glycine. Beyond being an important cofactor for NMDA activation, glycine is the major neurotransmitter released by interneurons in the spinal cord. This neurotransmitter acts on ionotropic channels and these channels behave in the same way as GABA-A receptors do. They are ligand-gated chloride channels. All right. Now that we have covered acetylcholine, glutamate, GABA, and glycine, I want to move on to another category of neurotransmitters, which are called biogenic amines. There are five well-established biogenic amines, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, and histamine. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.